meeting of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely, consistent with current state regulations, and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation by law, uh, uh, unless required by law. We don't anticipate this particular meeting will have public comment. However, I see in our panelist list that uh, uh, Latanya Steele uh, is here um, uh, as a director of aging services with the town. So we'll recognize her uh, as we proceed with the agenda. Um, uh, this uh, first, we will confirm that all members are uh, of the CEA are present. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, for others participating in the meeting, uh, please be aware that uh, other people will be able to see you. Anything you state uh, or share will be a matter of public record. All supporting material for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website at needham.gov, unless otherwise noted. Uh, the ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I will introduce any of the speakers on our agenda. After they conclude their remarks, uh, each board uh, member or council member will, have, uh, will be asked by name for any comment questions or any motions. Um, and just before we uh, take a roll call, I um, uh, just wanted to quickly ask uh, Latanya, uh, what item on the agenda are you looking to uh, participate on, or are you just observing <laughs> the whole of it? Just unmute. I just unmuted her. Okay. It looks like she's muted again. Oh, now she's free. I'm just observing uh, today. Okay. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. We also have Maureen Callahan from Representative Garlic's office. Oh, very good. Okay. Very good. Um, and Maureen, are you uh, observing or is there a specific item on the agenda you wish to speak to? No, just observing and um, reporting back to Representative Garlic. We're grateful that you're here and please pass our regards on to uh, Representative Garlic for us. I will do that. Very good. I will now uh, call the roll. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Stuart Agler? Here. Uh, Tina Burjo? Here. Uh, Glenn uh, Caminero? Here. Bill Day? Here. Virginia Fleischer? Here. <clears throat> uh, Bob Henschel? All right, we'll mark him as uh, not present, Amy, for now, but he'll probably jump in. Uh, Mo Handel. Here, and in answer to your previous question, um, early voting starts Saturday the 17th. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Adam Meisner. Here. Uh, David Montgomery. Here. Rick Putprush. Here. Excellent. Uh, we note that uh, Matt Talkoff got in touch with us earlier. He is not able to make it today. Um, uh, Michael Wilcox. Uh, Anne-Marie Dowd. And uh, Ted Owens. Okay, we'll mark those as uh, not present. Um, the, uh, uh, the first uh, order of business now, I guess, is uh, an update that we would ordinarily have from uh, Tim McDonald, our Director of Public Health, who's actually away this week on a well-deserved holiday. And, um, uh, and yet he was able to provide some notes to Amy and I. Amy, do you, uh, are you able to summarize and speak to those or would you like me to? Sure, I'm more than happy to uh, give some quick bullet points from Tim. Oh. Uh, I apologize, everyone. David seems to have his hand up. David Montgomery, you might be muted. Just a point of order. I, I noticed on the point on the agenda, you have the first first item is the minutes. Oh, I apologize. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Absolutely right. Um, I presume that everyone has had an opportunity to review the July uh, minutes and the August minutes. Uh, sorry, that uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. It was actually September 5th, 2020 minutes that should be reviewed. We already reviewed the July and August minutes last month. And we took a vote and approved those, I believe. Yes. So we're just dealing with the September minutes. Fantastic. Correct. Thank you. Correct. I, um, that's what happens when you go just on what's in front of you as opposed to by memory. Uh, uh, very good. So um, uh, everybody's had an opportunity to review. Does anybody have any comments about the September minutes? David, go ahead. Yeah, this is sort of from this um, ridiculous amount of time to, for such a small point, but um, with re there's a fre uh, reference in those minutes to the adoption of the July and August minutes. And despite my wanting to be there, I was in fact not present for the August meeting. And it says that I was present and we were trying to clarify it the last time. Um, just won't take credit for being there when I wasn't. Okay. I did make that update and those minutes um, were changed and posted to the town site with that change. Right, but the, the ch at least as showed here in the September minutes, the update you've made says that I was in fact present. And I was in fact absent. Okay. So it's just fessing up, thanks. That was, that was for the August? Yeah. Okay, so we'll make sure to clarify that. I appreciate you uh, um, reminding us of that. Uh, does anybody else have any other comments on the uh, uh, September minutes? I see none. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of our September meeting? So move. Thank you, Mo Mo moves. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Rick, I think? Yes. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the roll uh, and I'll do it in order of Zoom appearance. Uh, Mo. Yes. Stu. Yes. Bill. Yes. David. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Michael. Approved. Adam. Yes. Tina. Yes. Lee. Oh, uh, rather, Lee, good to see you. Sorry. Uh, Rick. Yes. <laughs> and Glenn. Yes. Very good. Uh, uh, any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are unanimously approved and passed. Um, at this point uh, in our agenda, we would now have uh, Tim from the Department of Health uh, give us an update. And uh, um, he's away, as I had mentioned before. So Amy, uh, are you able to provide us with sure. his note? Sure. So uh, straight from Tim McDonald, Director of Public Health Services for the Town of Needham. Cases have been slowly increasing in Needham since the beginning of September. The town has spent two consecutive weeks in the yellow category with approximately five daily cases per 100,000 population as assessed over a rolling two week period. The town's positive testing rate is fairly low at 0.63%, but has increased slightly since mid-September. Over last available two week period from September 20th to October 3rd, there have been 21 cases in Needham spread just about evenly across the age spectrum. There is no one source of cases in the community. Cases are coming through regular social interaction, which is commonplace when people are contagious before they start to feel ill, i.e. infectious before symptomatic. One observation of some, but not all, of the recent cases is that people appear to no longer be limiting their social activities. They are, they are seeing multiple groups of people and though compliance with distancing and face covering remains high, every social interaction outside of your immediate family, pod, or living arrangement group carries with it some risk of spreading infection. Public Health Department wants residents and business to consider their priorities and recognize that, although it is unappealing to think so, the pandemic means that we should limit some activities and some interactions in addition to observing distance and wearing face coverings. Needham has followed state guidelines and the governor's orders about reopening businesses and operations. Town has a slightly stricter face covering order than the state order. 
And the Public Health Division is available to meet and support businesses, including businesses not normally licensed or permitted by public health, by providing feedback and suggestions on how to comply with state COVID safety regulations. And then the town has provided information to the public about how to ha have a safe and happy and healthy Halloween. Actually, uh, he, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna interrupt there, I apologize. Sure. Sure. Uh, are we able to circulate uh, to our uh, to the council uh, the the town's uh, guidance for safe trick or treating? Sure, I can absolutely do that. That would probably be helpful. Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so that concludes uh, Mr. McDonald's report. So. Uh, uh, Bob raised an interesting question uh, in our uh, in a previous meeting that if the numbers of cases in Needham remain low, and I think the state's guideline is 5%, that whether more restrictions can be or restrictions can be um, uh, relaxed, in, you know, in, uh, in Needham. And I don't know... Um, I don't know what uh, the plan is for that. I, I, Tim, I think had uh, had said that the town does not intend to uh, release um, release some of the restrictions or um, and and to maintain it just because we're trying to be vigilant about stopping the spread. So uh, uh, I know that has been a challenge, and yet at least it looked like Greg was making a report about that. Uh, in his email today talking about, uh, you know, the governor had acknowledged that um, that uh, that the spread seems to be coming mostly, I think, from young kids going to parties and, and not social distancing and not wearing face masks. Uh, and that there does not seem to be any evidence, which is germane to our uh, topic now, uh, uh, of effectively getting uh, the coronavirus by attending a retail business or a restaurant business or working in an office. Did you want me to comment on that or? Sure, I don't know. Um, I would say Greg was picking that up from Governor Baker's conference yesterday and right. I would not have any additional information. Okay on that. Thank you. Mo? Yeah, I'm not going to speak for the health department or the board of health. That's a separate elected board. Um, but I think it's highly unlikely that the town would be more permissive than the state guidelines. And that's just speculation, but I think it's probably pretty accurate. I, I understand that. And Tim has alluded to that, I think, before. Um, and I uh, certainly understand that. I uh, so I'd like to open this up, uh, this part of the conversation to learn more about what is happening uh, across all the sectors of, of the commercial uh, business. Uh, Tina, uh, what's, uh, what's the action been like um, since uh, summer has basically over, we're now all back to school, so to speak? I think things have, in general have picked up for people. Um, Traffic is still a little bit slower than what we normally expect, but um, people seem to be out and about a little bit more. We're getting ready for holiday, so the you know we've been having conversations, we meaning um, other retailers, about strategies for uh, social distancing in our shops, strategies for continuing to uh, maintain mask wearing, hand sanitizing, you know, just responsibility on the part of not only the shop owners and staff, but also patrons. Uh, because I think that the holiday season is gonna be pretty decent for most of us. And I'm already starting to see early holiday, from my shop, early holiday shopping already, because Halloween was sort of truncated. Uh, so, we're just trying to figure out how we're going to navigate all that over the next couple months. Right. And have you, have you uh, noticed an impact of the 100 day challenge? Um, I 
personally have not. I think it's starting to take off a little bit. Um, we, a, a bunch of us just haven't had time to submit our video or really get into the program. So uh, I, I know that that was one of Greg's points was that it, it really is gonna take all of us to get involved. So it's just a matter of timing for a few of us. It's just a really busy time right now. Right. Trying to take care of other things retail wise. Right. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's, it's, there is definitely some visibility for retailers and restaurants because of it. Good, very good. And uh, at least on that, are, uh, what are you finding more broadly uh, of the, uh, how the 100 day program is impacting business? Well, we have about over 450 people, I think just about 450 on the Facebook group. There's a couple very avid posters, which is great to see. Um, the restaurants seem to be embracing it a little more. They um, have been doing great behind the scenes videos, but we also have track tech partners going around and shooting videos with the understanding that the retailers are really busy. And some of them are camera shy and again, don't have the bandwidth. So they've gone around and also big shout out to Megan and her brother from the Needham General Store. Uh, she has asked for a list of people that she and her brother could drop in on and do little visits. So it's kind of like, where's manager Mike? And some of that's up and running and that takes the onus off the retailer too. So um, they had about seven scheduled last week. They have seven scheduled this week. Um, we are about to launch the contest, the incentive to start posting, and we'll be doing giveaways every 10 days. And we had some really nice, <coughs> that's what's going to be launched in my update um, tomorrow is asking businesses who'd like to participate. We always already have about seven weeks of giveaways. Merchants just in hearing about it said, please include me. And they're stepping up with gift cards. That's not an expectation at all. Um, but they have really, um, we're going to put it out to everybody tomorrow, anybody else, and we'll be doing a live drawing every 10 days. And then the last thing will be that's rolling out a little closer to Halloween is a coloring contest. And it'll be kind of a village scene to color and you'll fill in your favorite retailer. So we're still working with the why, with Paula at the Y. She just reopened the Chestnut Street location. So she asked to push the contest launch back a week. Um, and we're fine because we have a lot, we have about 80 days left. So we want the momentum to stay. So we're going to do a Halloween coloring, coloring contest, a Thanksgiving one, and then a blue tree holiday theme one. So it's got a lot of components. Um, we're still talk, discussing a mural, a mural component. It uh, seems a little longer of a stretch there, but we're open to any other ideas and any of the, we're getting nice feedback from the real, uh, retailers, we're getting nice thank yous directly to Greg and the chamber team. So that's really what we want. We just want everyone to know that we're out there help, trying to help them. It's overlapping with our, our make, Keep Making Memories. It's our dining collaborative um, ish, initiative that came out of that group of restaurants that speaks every week. And there's an overlapping thing about dining out. We're heavily focused on Newton because they don't have the Needham 100 challenge, but Needham restaurants are also 100% available to participate in that. So I'm happy to answer any other questions anytime you want. We have a lot of information on our website. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adam, let's, uh, let's hear what's happening on the uh, um, brokerage side. Yeah, um, I mean, it's more or less the same as it was a month ago. I mean, maybe it slowed down a little bit like this week and last week in terms of tour volume. Um, I think people are still, you know, realizing that they, they have to do something. So they're going out and, and taking care of it. But in the last few days, just speaking to some clients um, you know, that don't have leases expiring in the next, let's say, six months or so they're you know still pushing to you know they want to bring everyone back to to um you know to the office rather than give up like half of it or so um we actually did a uh i spoke on a cornet event last it was about a week week and a half ago for the covid consortium that i'm a part of and you know we talked about um how there's like three different groups of people there's the like sub 30 group that want to get back to the office because they want to be with their colleagues and it's helped for brainstorming and go out for beers and then there's also um like the 30 plus that is you know less excited about going back to the office because it's a little more efficient for them to be at home especially with kids and homeschooling and then there's the you know c-level executives now that seem to have shifted back towards 
you know, wanting to get people back in the office initially, as you remember, they were all worried about it um, and how it's going to impact their business. And then it went smoother than expected um, and they were comfortable with it. But now I think it's gotten to the point where it's, you know, been going on for so long that they're actually realizing that it's negatively impacting their, their businesses from a creativity and a, you know, communication standpoint. And, you know, we talk with a lot of the, you know, owners of these companies and they're, you know, they're eager to get people back, but they're not, by no means are they pushing their employees to come in. It's more of a, you know, do what you feel comfortable type um, mentality because they don't want to be the, you know, the, the Scrooge that is like, you know, you need to get back to the office and I don't care, you know, what your thoughts are and everything. But um, it seems like some people are returning slowly more and more to the office, but it's not, you know, anywhere near, you know, I would say 50% or anything like that. It's probably more like, you know, 30% occupancy. Uh, and any um, people that are looking at space, are they looking at less space than perhaps they otherwise might have considered before? No, I mean, it's, you know, just because let's say 50% of your staff is going to be, you know, stay work you know, working remotely, you can't just reduce your space by 50% because you got to spread people out. A lot of these companies, especially like the tech companies had people sitting on top of each other before. Now they can't do that anymore. They need to spread them out. So it's like, you know, is it worth moving to save 20%, you know, of my space? And the answer is usually no, unless you're, you know, some giant, let's say organization. But I mean, if you're in, and Newton is comprised of a lot of like, let's say 2000 to you know, 15,000 Newton and Needham, uh, two to 15,000 square foot tenants. And to save, you know, just a couple square feet, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense just because of the cost to move. Um, we are seeing some expansions um, as well. We've done a few expansions in the last couple of months. Um, we were out, actually, we saw Mike Wilcox last Wednesday or Thursday uh, with a group that's a family law practice who, as you can imagine, is... Um, crushing it right now, given, you know, what's going on and people kind of at, you know, at each other, at each other's throats and everything. So they're actually looking to expand. Um, so there are some companies that are looking for more space right now. And do they, uh, does that uh, uh, client have existing space in the area or do they have space from uh, other locations? They're, uh, they're in Wellesley right now and they have a lease that's expiring in the next 12 months or so. I think it's eight or 10 months from now. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're initially, they wanted to just stay in Wellesley just because that's where a lot of their clientele is, but Wellesley's so much more expensive than Newton or Needham. And frankly, like the buildings there aren't nicer necessarily. Um, so they're entertaining, you know, moving to Newton or Needham be, to save a few dollars, um, but take higher quality space, so. Okay, so it's so not a lot of buildings. There's not a lot of spaces in Wellesley anyways. Uh, it's just a much smaller market from an office perspective. Right. And Mike, what's, uh, what's your experience been like this past month? I think we've sort of settled into a, <clears throat> you know, normal as it will be, um, probably for the, the next few quarters. Um, we've transacted a few leases, but they tend to be um, with mostly traditional insurance, financial services, and legal firms that, um, you know, from looking at our portfolio, those tend to be the tenants that are coming into their space uh, and using it still. And they're obviously, as I just said, looking to, um, to transact and, and enter into, you know, five to 10 year leases. Um, it's the tech sector that is really the one that I'm seeing from both an occupancy point of view, as well as a you know, we can only look at those tenants that are rolling in the next, say, six to 12 months in terms of lease expirations as to what they're planning, because they're the only people that can really effectuate change at this point. And um, on the tech side, I see a lot of tenants uh, hitting the pause button. And um, I don't know if it is long term, short term um, changes, but um, they need less space. They may need no space for a period of time until they feel comfortable going back into a physical um, location. So that's a, that's a concern of ours. And um, I mean, time will tell. Um, I don't see uh, a lot of Boston area tenants coming out. We have a few showings, but it's, I don't think that is still a trend that um, 
has become real as opposed to something that just people are, are talking about as, as something that uh, may occur. But, you know, we don't have a lot of product in Boston, but I, I do hear it's very quiet there. There's a lot of sublease space there. Our rates have remained pretty much um, consistent. We haven't seen a, a dramatic change in, um, in lease terms. And, um, you know, we have some product in Cambridge too, where we just finalized um, a letter of intent for a tenant taking about 35,000 square feet of lab space with us. And that market is, as all you know, and we've talked before, has remained very robust and tends to be sort of the focus of a lot of landlords now as to how they can get their their buildings uh, more lab um, orientated to, you know, sort of tap into that, that demand that um, certainly is continuing at this point. Thank you. Uh, Adam, just to go back, uh, Rick, and then I'll, I'll come to you in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a second. Are you seeing uh, more broadly a shift in pricing at all or other lease terms? Nope. It's, well, first off, let me say, you know, it's funny. I mean, everyone knows the media and, you know, how they can spin things and everything until you're actually like, at least from my perspective, until you're the one that's like, that they're talking about, you don't realize just how much, like what they're putting out there is, it's focused on one thing. Like they don't necessarily detail exactly what they're specifically talking about. I mean, they're saying like the commercial real estate market is just horrible right now. It's completely imploding. And because of that, like every time I talk to someone that I haven't spoken to in a few months, or they're like, they ask how, how's the, commercial real estate business doing like they're afraid to ask and I'm like look it's okay in the suburbs it's not nearly as bad as downtown but it's also as Mike you know said before the ones with the expiring leases those are the ones that can you know shift the market right downtown nobody's going in there right now but it's not like all these buildings are vacant meaning they don't have leases because these companies have leases right and they can't just walk away from them so i mean while the downtown market is is really quiet right now from what i've heard as well it's not like all these buildings don't have leases or or income you know from paying tenants and everything so um but to answer your question adam no we haven't really seen a shift in in pricing at all because it's like i said the you know the suburban market the 128 market the areas that i really focus on haven't been impacted nearly as much as, as downtown. People aren't as hesitant to go into their office. Don't get me wrong, there's still a strong majority of them that don't wanna go in, or, but I think it's less likely that they're going to go into downtown than, than they are you know, to the suburbs. So I don't think landlords have really felt the squeeze from all these tenants you know, vacating and, and letting their leases expire and everything. Thank you. Rick, and uh, to David. I think that the uh, uh, every, everything that Adam and Mike uh, has said is, is absolutely true for those particular property types. The darlings of the market right now are lab space. Everyone's trying to convert space or develop space for, for lab in anticipation of uh, future growth. But I will tell you uh, right now, industrial space, particularly warehouse distribution space, is really the darling property type of the real estate market. Um, on a property that we own, we, we actually uh, extended a, a tenant in the, in the midst of the pandemic at higher rates than they otherwise would have paid because of the location. Um, this e-commerce uh, uh, environment, anybody who's uh, shipping and receiving or uh, being a mini Amazon or a, a specific type of product uh, for a larger uh, group like an Amazon or a Walmart or something like that. Uh, industrial properties are just, are just doing very, very well. And they are, uh, uh, the, the rents are going up. We're also seeing a lot of owned industrial space right now uh, coming up as sale leaseback uh, opportunities for people. People are trying to take advantage of the pile of cash that they're sitting in as an owner, the, the, the four walls and the roofing that they're, that they're sitting in that they own, uh, rather than use their debt capacity, uh, they can sell their properties now, sign a lease to, to lease it back because they weren't planning on moving anyway and get a, a pile of cash because um, the, the, the cap rates for those types of deals are, are, 
are so low, meaning the, the prices are, are so high. So there are a lot of owners now starting to take advantage of, uh, of that. So I would say uh, other than like the, the, the retail and, and, and the office, um, uh, warehouse distribution is, is doing just fine in this market. And Rick, uh, can you remind us where that property is that you're speaking of? Um, which, which one? The, the, uh, the one that you at least up at, a, at a higher rent rates. Uh, it's in Dedham. It's in Dedham, okay. Yeah. And how many, how many square feet is that property? Uh, 20,000. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, David, you had your hand up. Yes, thanks. Um, sort of following up on your question, Adam, uh, and I think this is primarily for all three of Mike and Adam and, and Rick. Um, in, in, the, in these situations where you do have some tenants uh, coming up with leases expiring, um, have they been pushing for new terms, not just a uh, changing of rent values, but um, I'm wondering about buyout provisions. Are they, are they asking for some kind of leeway that they previously haven't had, but now their eyes are open under the current circumstances? It, has there any been, been such push? And if so, how have you responded? I mean, it's a traditional sort of tool for some tenants, even before this um, situation in the market to ask for a uh, termination rate, like on a five year, they can kick out a three and, and pay uh, some price to have that flexibility. I will say that a lot of the tenants that I am engaging with on renewals um, that are talking to us about it versus just waiting are looking for short term now. They want a year. Uh, they want to go even month to month with some notice provision. So, um, you know, a lot of instability in the market has created this um, view of tenants wanting just to go short on their leases and, and keep that flexibility. Yeah, I think to add to, to what Mike just said, we're seeing that as well. Um, and it's more because I think a lot of these businesses don't want to make a decision. You know, most of these leases typically are three, five, seven year leases, right? And they don't want to make the wrong decision based on today's news that's going to impact them for the next three to five years. So like we were out with a group that was looking to downsize, cut their space in half a couple of weeks ago. And now they're saying, you know what, actually, can we just extend for one year, even though it's going to be a higher rent per square foot than, you know, what we're paying now and double the space we need. We just don't want to move and then realize in a year that we're going to be, that we shot ourselves in the foot. Um, additionally, in terms of, and I'm curious to hear what, what Mike has to say on this, but in terms of like, COVID language, we haven't really seen many, you know, landlords or land, any landlords at all giving a discount on rent in the event there's another shutdown and, and people can't go into the office because, which is understandable because these landlords have to pay their lenders and their lenders aren't going to just let them, you know, stop paying for a month or two months. But what we are seeing a little bit, David, on new leases is, um, if a space or if, if there's another shutdown as it relates to COVID when the lease is supposed to expire or to commence rather, the commencement date will be pushed back and they won't be charged, you know, rent during that period until it, you know, opens up again, basically. Um, I'm not sure how relevant it is to what you all do, but I have seen with, um, with a couple of clients that there, there is a tension um, being given to how to share the risk or allocate the risk of a, of a COVID um, outbreak within the space. And so um, the, the landlord who doesn't want to have anything to do it is eager to put that responsibility clearly on the, on the tenant. I mean, I think our experience is bad. It's real quick. The landlord is responsible for the common areas and the tenants take responsibility for within their space. And if you go into any of our buildings, we've we put in hands-free entries to the restrooms. We have a temperature taker when you enter the building um, and other measures, signage, et cetera, education. Um, but that's the landlord's sort of domain and it's for tenants responsibility uh, to ensure, you know, safety protocols within their space as they, as they see fit. And kudos to, to Mike and his company. They've done more. I go through a lot of, you know, different buildings and everything. And like I said, I was with Mike last week at one of their buildings. They've done more 
um, safety, you know, precautionary things in their buildings than, than most other landlords have. I mean, they have, you know, um, foot poles on the restroom doors. They have, you know, uh, touchless entry. They have, um, you could put your wrist up and to uh, the machine when you walk in the building, it's taking your temperature. And then of course, you know, Purell and everything, but you know, good work by them. Most landlords aren't doing, they're putting Purell in the, in the common areas, but that's really it. So. To, uh, to dovetail with what Mike was saying in, uh, we own a medical office building and one of our tenants uh, had an incident with uh, one of their registered nurses coming down with COVID and uh, you know, it was in their space, but we felt compelled as landlords to come in and, and go through and uh, in all the common areas and uh, had that taken care of after that incident. We haven't had an incident since. But I think, I think the landlord, as Mike was saying as well, uh, bears a responsibility uh, to protect the other tenants. You don't know where that one particular tenant, uh, the registered nurse might have gone throughout the building so uh, I, I think it's a responsibility of the landlord to, uh, to make sure that the other tenants are protected as, as much as they can. Has there, has there been any um, language either one side or the other negotiating leases dealing with uh, building HVAC equipment and who bears uh, responsibility to increase filter, uh, air filtration or air quality? Has that come up in any of the lease negotiations? I mean, that's another measure we do with certain filters we put on our units. But um, I mean, face it, I think what we've seen, it's been seven months. The, the office can be a very safe environment if handled correctly. And we put out these measures. Thank you, Adam. Um, but we're still seeing large volumes of our population not coming in. And um, I don't know whether that's going to change as we sort of move into the darker, colder months where maybe being at home isn't as... Uh, as of a nice uh, attraction to people as, uh, you know, as it has been the last few months, but we can create a safe environment. And as the governor says, it's not happening in offices, but people are still choosing to work from home. And that is gonna be, a, I think, a lingering thing that we're gonna have to sort of understand going forward as to how long standing that will be. And, 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 you know, it certainly seems at this point, it's gonna be a component of how a company operates going forward, uh, just as a result of this experiment, if you will. We've heard a, a couple of things. I, I think um, one of the issues of uh, the spread of COVID is being in an enclosed area uh, for a long period of time, over 15 minutes. Uh, if you're in a, a house or something like that, you're, you're not experiencing the, the same kinds of controls you could have in an office building. Uh, again, as Mike was alluding to, uh, it, it could be a safe space because you can, you can manage the number of air changes that you have uh, through the HVAC systems in an office building. And that is, in a way, uh, helping to uh, alleviate some of the issues of spreading COVID by being able to bring in fresh air into the building uh, on, a, on, a, on a constant basis. That makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions about Real estate, I think Lee's, um, uh, uh, the chamber is hosting another re uh, real estate uh, event about how the coronavirus is affecting um, real estate development in particular. Um, um, construction, the construction the industry, and that was put together by a real estate committee. So um, I think Chris Keeley from Bowdoin Construction right here in Needham put together that panel and that's tomorrow open to anybody. If and is, like that, to... uh, is that uh, residential construction and commercial office, retail construction, industrial construction? I think it's more commercial from what I, the little I know about the panel. It okay. seems much more geared towards commercial. Okay. Thank yeah, you very much. They typically, Bowdoin typically does more, uh, comm I think they only do commercial actually. I think they, so, I think they so. They do a lot of educational and, you know, um, like religious uh, buildings. I think they did St. Seb's. I think they did this St. Sebastian's renovation recently. So yeah. Um, they just did Temple Beth Avoda in Newton. They do a lot of schools as well. Interesting, okay. Thank you. But that's tomorrow morning, I believe at 10, 10 o'clock. Open to everybody. 
Thank you. If, uh, if anyone has any particular interest in that, uh, Lise, is it okay if they reach out to me or perhaps you directly? Um, yeah, I think it's open to members and non-members. So um, you can just go to our website and click on the event and register, but I'm happy to take anybody um, and do it for you on the back end. But Thanks very, it, thank you try much. to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I've uh, recently spoken to somebody from um, Gilbane Construction, and uh, they painted a very positive picture of their business uh, activity. So things are going well for them. That's good. That's good to hear. And financing remains available, I'm sure, uh, for these uh, developments that hasn't yes. stopped. Good. Um, Turning part of the problem, Adam, one thing just to add to it, part of the problem is like a lot of um, these subs from what I've been hearing are collecting more in, in unemployment than, you know, if they're actually working and everything. So it's been a challenge for them to, or for a lot of these GCs to get their subs back to work, um, you know, because of that, which is unfortunate. So. Oh, that's interesting. Even though the federal, uh, not bonus, but the, uh, the federal amount has subsided that's still the case though it certainly was a, you know the case when the federal augmented what the state was contributing but that program ran out i think the end of july yeah i mean i think it's gotten better i mean there are still some that are that are doing it but i mean i'm not as close to the construction right. industry. i just you know i had heard that like a couple of weeks ago that that was a major problem that that a lot of these gcs were facing i think that's been a challenge for a number of businesses where people were making more money on unemployment insurance than they otherwise would be. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I'm now going to turn uh, uh, to the next item on our agenda, uh, which is a review that uh, of the Chapter 40B housing guidelines that, um, that have been circulated around. Um, uh, Mo, this came from, uh, from Dan. Uh, and... Um, and it sounded like he was looking for comment from different boards, I think by November, and it might be before we meet next. Um, I, so I, I, we, we sent these guidelines around. I don't know if anybody has any immediate comment. Does anybody have any immediate comment on it? Well, let me I have a question. Sorry, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna go to Rick and then I'll go to Mo. Go ahead, Rick. What what is the AMI for for Needham? What do you mean by AMI? The area median income. Yes. Uh, so we do it regionally, but it's eighty thousand dollars for a family of four is what gets you into uh, affordable housing qualification. At the at the you know the higher end yeah. of affordable housing. So it's pretty high. I think that's a misconception with a lot of people when they start talking about 40B, uh, low income. When you get to a place like a Needham, uh, it's not so low income. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. And may I speak to this a little bit? Please, please. Uh, first of all, the background on this. Um, for years, we've had a, uh, a requirement to produce an afford, an, a housing plan. Dan Matthews took it upon himself uh, with the consent of the, our board to update the prior plan, which was done several years ago. So that's why this is out for comment. The, we have met our 40B obligations under current state law, which requires the 10% of our housing stock be nominally uh, 40B eligible. In other words, Although it says uh, affordable housing for low and moderate income people, only a portion of those units are actually geared for those folks. Three quarters of the units or more go to market rate. So that's why this is out for comment. Our policy has been, and this, this is a responsibility my board shares with the planning board, is to assure that new development, especially new multi-housing development, multi-unit development, 
produces a ratio of affordable units that doesn't compromise our 10%. Now that's been the approach we've taken to preserve our control over our own zoning. There is a growing issue with respect to housing equity in the region. Uh, there is going to be a shortage of approximately 400,000 units of housing in general in this region over the next 10 to 20 years. And then there's the other issue of racial and income equity with respect to the burden that the suburbs share. That's all background. Um, so this plan reflects where we were with some updating by Dan from several years ago, trying to meet the affordable housing requirements. That's why it's up for comment because we need to update it. And that there are constituencies that have a stake in this. That background in, uh, in particular is, uh, is very helpful. Thank you. Um, it looked, you know, some of the key questions that come up, up from this seems to be um, what are the areas, the priority areas for development? Where would, where is the best place in Needham for uh, increasing that capacity? And what are the density goals? Um, and I'm not sure if, uh, if we'd have enough time as the CEA to necessarily comment on either of those. Uh, we have looked before at, you know, at density and we've looked at uh, uh, changing zoning in, in various areas. Um, uh, I think maybe what I might do is ask people to, uh, to look through the guidelines that Dan had prepared and to provide me with any comments so we, or uh, Amy, so we can pass those on to, this, uh, to the select board and also uh, to the planning department as well. Um, Lee, is there anything in particular that, uh, I thought maybe we would go through the, you know, the zoning map. Uh, um, I don't know if we're gonna have time necessarily to do that right now uh, and focus on the question of zoning um, and location, uh, priority locations. Before Lee addresses that, can I just make a comment? Yes, please. That is an enormous question that bears on every resident of the town. Exactly. And is not, it's, I mean, the planning board has a major role in that. Um, more, more, I think, than my board. Um, but, you know, the characteristics of this community and every suburban community with respect to how urban it becomes, because that's what density means, is a major, major issue. So I don't know how much it's going to profit us to discuss the zoning map here. I understand, I appreciate that. Then what I will do is uh, ask people to, uh, to review the attachment if they have any comment to, uh, uh, to provide that. Um, to us so we can share that along and uh, circle it back to, uh, to Dan. But I didn't mean to cut Lee out of this conversation because she has a major role in it. No, I, I think your answer was, was appropriate, Mo. Virginia, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just have a question on the background you gave us, Mo, and you yes. said three quarters of the affordable units are actually at market rate. Yes. So can you just explain that? Because yeah. I... And, and Lee can correct me because I'll get the percentages wrong. But if you're a developer and you do rental housing, and I believe it's 20% or 25% Lee? 25, I think. 25% has so to be. 25% meet the affordable guidelines. The remaining units count in the affordable inventory according to the state mandate that communities produce 10% of their housing or have 20% of their housing deemed affordable. So it's deemed units, not real units. And okay, the reason sorry. for that is yeah. to incent developers to produce multifamily development and be able to carry the cost of providing affordable units. Okay. Which so, by the way are expensive. Right. So if the so when if we have our ten if we've met our ten percent hurdle, yes, we really only met 
two and a half percent really, or we've got the 10 percent includes just this 25 percent? The 10 percent includes all of the rental units that are in multi-unit developments, 25 percent of which have are affordable units. In and other words, if you have a hundred unit development, if the town has a hundred, if, if the, a developer came to this town before we met the 10% threshold yeah. and had a hundred unit development proposal, 25% of the units of which were rental affordable, a hundred units would count towards the 10% requirement. So okay. Neaton has about 12,000 housing units, Lee? Yes. So 120, 1,200 of those units are deemed to be in the affordable inventory, although somewhere between that and 25% of that are actually affordable for people who are at the very high end of the need scale. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks for that background. That'll help me when I review the document because I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, most suburban communities don't meet the 10%, although more and more are. But even meeting the 10% doesn't mean that we're carrying mm -hmm. our fair share of the social and economic burden mm -hmm. of the region, depending on who you talk to. So um, that's why the pressure. Yeah. Okay. And the need. I mean, we're trying to meet a need here, too. Right, right. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Amy, I'm going to call on you for an update. Sure. So we've added something new to our agenda, the Economic Development Manager Report, and be doing this every month just for me to give you all uh, sort of an overview of what I've been doing and what I'm hearing, uh, or as Adam would say, the word on the street. So I've been meeting with a lot of businesses throughout Needham over the last uh, few weeks since we last met. Um, in Hersey, Needham Center, some in the Heights, I'm gonna focus more on the Heights uh, this week and next week, uh, just to check in to introduce myself so that they know um, they have somebody at town hall that they can you know, connect with, uh, have questions answered, and also just check in with them and see how, how things are going. And I have to first say that the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive from um, all types of businesses on the support that they have received from the town. Um, overwhelmingly, there are several business owners who have multiple locations in Needham and other towns or cities. And they've said hands down, um, Needham is, is done, has done a fantastic job. So that speaks volumes to all of the uh, elected officials, volunteers like yourselves um, and, the, and the staff, certainly that predates me um, uh, at, at town hall. So that was really nice to hear. Um, retailers, as we have already, you know, heard from Tina are, are struggling. They are gearing up for what they hope to be a busy fourth quarter. Um, I did hear some feedback uh, over the last, you know, several weeks that there's been a lot of attention on the restaurants, which is specifically why I've focused on the retailers just to check in um, and, and see how we can help them. Um, we've tried to think outside the box. Is there a way to expand merchandising outside their storefront? I heard um, some uh, retailers saying that they would be very interested in doing so, perhaps um, expanding it underneath tents. We even talked about putting the pedestrian way in the on-street parking spots um, in areas where the sidewalks are very narrow. Um, of, went out even uh, you know on Friday I visited with a couple of the retailers secondhand rows which was one of the retailers who was interested in doing so and the sidewalks are very narrow and in speaking with two of the owners uh, they decided they did not want to give up the on-street spots in front of their shop um, and there was concern about weather elements um, you know sun and rain you know despite having a tent out there and so when they reconsidered, they decided that they did not want, in fact, do that. Um, 
the other thing that I'm uh, doing is seeing if I can coordinate with retailers to stay open late on probably Thursday night. Uh, that seems to be the preference, Thursday or Friday nights. Uh, coordinate them all to stay open late on the uh, weeks in December leading up to the holidays so that we can help promote that the retailers are, are open. A lot of them close uh, at five o'clock and by having one coordinated evening, I'm hoping that people might combine you know, some shopping with perhaps dining out or, or grabbing some takeout. Um, there have been other ideas that have been thrown out. Wouldn't it be great if the town could um, increase the snow removal on the sidewalks in Needham Center, for example, um, that's something I'm in conversations with DPW to explore you know, the feasibility of, of doing that. Um, you know, there have been other ideas that have been thrown out um, that I think are not feasible. But again, uh, you know, if they had a wish list, they would throw things out there. And I said, uh, you know, certainly hearing you and, and they feel listened to. And I think that, that is one of the most important things. Um, the restaurants, um, stating the obvious, they're all very concerned about the colder weather arriving and the outdoor dining uh, drying up pretty quickly. I have to say I was very surprised to hear some of the rents that the restaurants are, are paying. Um, I'm not going to call anybody out in specific, but you know, the ones in, in Needham Center, uh, it's, it's really incredible how they're continuing to make it work given that uh, business is down anywhere from 40 to 60 percent, generally speaking, for most of these restaurants. Um, however, you've got some, a lot of them that are thinking outside the box and doing some creative uh, things. Their, their takeout has increased. For example, Hearth, 92 uh, percent of their business is takeout. Um, even though they've got the outdoor dining behind, they've got outdoor, you know, they've got heaters out there. Um, you know, kudos to the um, fire department for working so quickly to help get these restaurants, uh, you know, do the inspections to get the heaters in place. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of concern, but uh, again, they appreciate the fact that they're being listened to and feel as though the health department, the town manager's office, everyone has been super supportive. Um, and so there's a tremendous gratitude for that. Anybody have any specific questions on small businesses before I move on? Yes. I just I just want to point out that we, the downtown subcommittee of this committee did work with the snow plowing and you probably should have already heard from Kate. There's a, they ordered a machine. Yes. And it did test runs last year. So I guess that can be expanded for this year. Yes, I think it may be a matter of uh, staffing resources, but I'm in conversations with DPW to uh, get more clarification on that. Great, thank you. Hey, Adam, uh, I'm sorry, I have a 10 o'clock I have to go to, so okay. I have to drop off. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks for your participation. Yes, Stu. I hey, Amy, just a quick question. Have you heard anything about Blue? Are they done? Are they coming back? Uh, what is their status? They haven't been open, I don't think, since this thing started. Yeah, I have not heard um, anything specific to Blue. Um, I, I don't know that, but it's on my radar. So if, if anybody happens to hear anything, you know, through the grapevine, please let me know. But uh, they're on my list of people to reach out to just to check in. Very good. I have to come for a 10 o'clock call as well. Sorry, Adam and everybody. That's okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Adam. Yeah. You bet. Obviously, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or whatever. So, yeah. Thank you. Take care, um, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Bye. And um, just uh, very quickly as well is that I've actually uh, joined together um, an informal group of other economic development uh, managers and directors from surrounding communities, and we are meeting bi-weekly via Zoom, uh, so towns including Natick and Ashland and Somerville and Cambridge, Brookline, Lexington, Concord, New Newton, Arlington, Watertown, Dedham, Walpole, Hudson, um, among others. Um, and I, we sort of joked, somebody said this is like group therapy because we're all um, experiencing the same thing, but you know, in different geographic areas. Um, but you know, some great idea sharing. We meet for an hour every other Wednesday and um, hearing some creative ideas, for example, the town of Natick, um, they're doing almost like an Amazon locker um, that they have, you know, at Whole Foods where you can pick your things up. They're working with local retailers to uh, create something like that. So to minimize uh, 
you know, face-to-face -face contact, um, having lockers so that if people purchase something, they can store it in a locker and then come pick it up. Um, but the same thing, a lot of you know, these, these towns and cities who have relied on community events and promotions um, are all you know, looking for ways to help support the small businesses. Um, so it's been really valuable. We've had two meetings so far and uh, I'll be meeting with them again next week. Um, in addition, I reached out to uh, our representative at MAPC. Uh, Mo, I know you're involved um, with that as well, but Josh Eichen of the um, TRIC Council, the uh, Three Rivers Interlocal Council, of which Needham is a member, including other uh, local municipalities, and uh, connected with our coordinator there. I'm going to be participating in a workshop this Friday for uh, small businesses, um, again, economic development folks and planners talking about ways to support small businesses as the uh, colder weather is arriving. So that's happening this week. And I'll be attending their monthly um, economic development uh, meetings as well. Um, so that's happening. And uh, also working with the chamber, shout out to Lise and uh, the folks at the Newton Needham Chamber of Commerce. Um, they have expended a tremendous time and resources to um, promote the 100 day campaign. And I, again, in my conversations with uh, the small businesses, it's tremendously appreciated. They feel as though people are, are paying attention and I've seen the activity on social media. And so I just wanted to give a shout out for the amount of time and resources as well as Track Tech Partners, which has uh, donated their, their time. So a lot of my focus um, in recent weeks has been on the small business community to check in with them and, and see you know, what we can do creatively to help support them. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be uh, especially interested in hearing uh, what other towns are doing that we're not doing and what effect positive or negative that's having. Uh, so if there's other things that we can adopt in Needham that can help business of all kinds that uh, that's really helpful. Yes, so I just uh, also wanted to um, to add that Needham is also uh, quite a trailblazer and it's one of the first communities that uh, reduced the annual liquor license fees for uh, restaurants um, and in other establishments with liquor licenses. Um, there were very few uh, other towns and cities that have done so and in fact um, I've actually gotten several follow-up um, contacts from people wanting to learn more. So, you know, two thumbs up to uh, the select board for being um, proactive and, and, and leading, leading on that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, word on the street is, uh, is effective, an effective way for us to hear what uh, business, you know, has to say. And I'm uh, grateful that you're taking the time to reach out. Uh, you know, and uh, specifically business to business. Rick. Yeah, um, Amy, in, in your travels, uh, Needham is, is, is kind of known as a restaurant town, uh, you know, between the Dover and Wellesley's and whatever. Um, and it's kind of a lifeblood uh, here and uh, everybody wants to see them remain open. In your discussions with these restaurants, have uh, have they talked about the coming months, November, December, through the winter, like what they're going to need or what what the town could do to to help them um, survive? Has has anything come up or have they thought through like what am I going to do in December when it's cold out and, and people don't want to sit outside? Uh, how and I don't know the answer to this, but you know how how can can the town of Needham help? Uh, keep them alive? Sure. So that's uh, definitely a question I've been asking is what more can the town be doing to support you? And, um, you know, so far we haven't come up with anything that hasn't yet been done. However, there are, you know, external um, groups that are, are helping, again, the chamber helping to coordinate the Newton Needham Dining Collaborative, um, you know, the um, trying to continue to remind people that it's safe to, to eat out. Um, we have a, our third and final uh, Dine Out Needham, which is happening this evening uh, with a lot of local restaurants. Um, so I think, you know, again, just reminding people how important it is to support the local restaurants. And many of the restaurateurs are, are hoping that uh, 
the business will translate from you know the outdoor dining to indoor dining, um, but many of them are, are somewhat skeptical that the numbers will remain the same for um, for people wanting to dine in person um, inside in, in the same manner that they've done outside, but hope that those uh, dollars translate into takeout in the coming months, that when people are feeling, you know, if they're feeling less comfortable eating out, that they'll turn their support to takeout, um, you know, as, as the winter months uh, arrive. But I think there's a sort of a collective, uh, you know, uh, hesitation on, on everyone's part um, and just hoping. So if we just continue to push how important it is to support not only restaurants, but obviously retailers as well, um, they're all bracing for what's going to be a very challenging several months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Lee, I'd like to uh, pick up here with you and ask uh, if there have been other business uh, permits issued. Um, well, actually, um, I wanted to update people on two applications that were recently filed, actually filed this week, because I think they're probably the most significant projects we have moving forward on. Um, so Boston Children's Hospital has filed their application for special permit to build out their 225,000 square foot pediatric hospital um, at 380 um, First Avenue. And that project's gonna be scheduled for you know, a, a public hearing on November the 17th. And just for people who aren't familiar with that project overall, that is part of what was approved as Center 128 um, West. Um, 740,000 square feet was approved at that location for, with four office buildings, one of which has been built out, which is a TripAdvisor building and portions of two parking garages. So this represents the second building to be built out in that in that, in that project um, scheme. Um, and they're also proposing, I think it's a function of building out just the hospital presently and holding the pads for the other two lo building locations to be built out at a later date. And they're talking uh, for this particular phase, they're going to be expanding um, garage B by a little over 500 parking spaces to accommodate this use, along with providing for a temporary on-site parking um, facility on A Street. So that project just came in this week. Um, it's going to be reviewed by town staff and the public hearing on it will be held um, on the 17th of November. Um, the other filing we got this week um, is on what was the parametrics building, you know, IDG is going in there. And because they're looking at converting it um, from what was a single tenancy to a multi-tenancy at the building, they're proposing to do some improvements on the property. Uh, the first involves taking what was the pavilion, which connected building A and B, and upgrading that space to include um, a fitness center and a cafeteria space, um, providing um, an individual access into each individual building to accommodate separate tenancies. I think um, IDG is going into building B. They're also talking about expanding their patio space behind the building and providing for stronger linkages between their facility and Cutler Lake behind the building. So that project too was filed this week. Um, and it also has been scheduled for a planning board public hearing on the 17th. Um, parametrics, I mean, IDG is going forward though, independent of the site plan approval from the planning board to do, to begin the internal renovations of their building, which were not really covered under the terms of the site plan special permit. So they are moving forward on the project and we're just gonna be tinkering with um, some of the outside amenities and um, providing for this, these upgrades to provide for a common space between the buildings. In terms of permits the planning board issued um, at their last meeting, um, there was a permit that was issued to Petco um, to allow um, a veterinary service to be offered at, at that location. Um, and there was a transfer of a permit um, on Highland Avenue in what is the building where Trader Joe's is located to allow a, a facility to go in that will provide for skin resurfacing and laser type um, medical um, activities. Um, so those are the permits that the planning board has been working on, but I think the two most significant are the two I just described, the children's and IDG. The other update is that the town passed the overlay district um, and um, congratulations to Adam. He did a wonderful job uh, uh, on the video explaining the project 
and the planning board only, only received one question at town meeting, which is almost unheard of, um, and the article successfully passed. So we anticipate that Carter Mill will be going forward and the planning board will be processing the permits for what will be a wonderful addition uh, to Avery Square, allowing for you know, construction of independent living units, assisted living units, and a memory facility serving Needham residents and the region as a whole. Um, and lastly, I would say in terms of planning activities, um, we received um, from uh, on Highway Commercial One, we received um, the traffic study of the first phase of the traffic study from the traffic consultant. It's being currently reviewed um, by staff in-house. Um, there are some minor modifications we're going to ask the consultant to make to that draft. Um, and then we're setting up a meeting with the working group um, to review the recommendations that are coming out of that study and, and the um, outlines in terms of the improvements that would be required for build out at um, the Muzzy Channel 5 site um, at an FAR of 1.75 um, with a split, with an even split between office use and research and development with ancillary retail at 15%. So that was the first um, um, scenario um, that was to be modeled on the traffic side to look at the impacts of that development profile on the intersections in the area and the, and the, and the ability of the infrastructure to accommodate those, that activity. And then we anticipate that um, once that's reviewed, there will be two other scenarios that are modeled to assist the committee um, in coming up with the final land use mix and density profile moving forward on the Channel 5 Muzzy site for a zoning article to be presented in the spring. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Bill, go ahead. Uh, yeah, there, there was a really interesting link on the Needham-Newton chamber on um, the daily, the daily um, email that uh, we get uh, that took us to a flyover for that uh, Riverside uh, project that's going up in Newton. And uh, I don't know how expensive those things are, but uh, if something like that could be done for uh, Muzzy Channel 5, uh, it might uh, help explain what's going to happen there. It's a great, uh, that's a great point. It's a, certainly an effective tool to communicate. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Rick, go ahead. Uh, Lee, this is for you. Lee, I have a uh question outside of this meeting to, to ask you regarding zoning. Do you, is there a number that's the best number to contact you at? Why don't I send you an email and I can let you know. Okay. I'll, I'll send you an email and we can, we can connect. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Very good. Does anybody else have anything? Doesn't look like it. Thank you all. Uh, much. Yes. I, 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 I have one thing. Uh, something I heard yesterday. Um, to add perspective to what we're going through right now, I thought it was kind of cute. Yes. The word stressed, spelled backwards, is desserts. <laughs> so, okay. just to add a little perspective. <laughs> I have one thing. It's, yes, Virginia. Do, do we have the meeting series going forward? Because I seem to be missing it. <laughs> I will send that out to everyone this afternoon. I was going to connect with... Uh, Adam, it looks as though in the past there's been um, a combination November, December um, meeting, depending on where the holidays fall. So um, I will send something out okay. to everyone um, later today with a meeting schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So move. And a second. Second. Okay. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing that, I'm going to uh, call the vote by uh, by appearance on Zoom. Mo, yes. Stu, yes. Bill, yes. Virginia, yes. David, yes. Glenn, yes. Rick, yes. I as chair vote yes as well. Uh, the motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Be safe, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thanks very kindly.